Hi, I'm Phil Howard, director of the Center for Media, Data, and Society. This is our Media and Change video series, and it's a real pleasure to welcome Cory Doctorow to Budapest for a conversation. Welcome. Thank you. So, um, there are lots of things we could talk about, but you're one of the few who can talk about the UK and Canada and the US in a comparative perspective mm -hmm. um, when it comes to media and privacy. For me, one of the interesting things about the US is it's a country that's never going to have a privacy czar, right? It doesn't seem possible that the US will ever have one person who can be the point person for privacy issues. The UK has a privacy czar, the Canada mm -hmm. has a privacy czar, but they don't always work very well. I'm curious about why you think that America couldn't have one. They've had czars for pretty weird things. They have. But it would, it would take multiple agencies agreeing to uh, oh, transfer see. over uh, significant domains of legal turf to somebody who might actually call out government mistakes. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. I, I guess that's, I, I will, I will uh, stipulate okay. anyway that, we, that, that it would be particularly difficult to mm. have uh, a privacy czar in America. I, I, the future is hard to predict. The future is hard to predict. Yeah. Too. Although you do it well in some No, no, no. Ways. Science uh, fiction writers only predict the present. They never predict the future. They never predict the future? Yeah. Okay. Science fiction writers who think they can predict the future are like drug dealers who sample their own product. It, it never <laughs> ends well. It doesn't end well? No. It, or you end up with a cult. Yeah, you, yeah right? that's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, okay, so the privacy, it, it's possible that the U.S. might generate a privacy SAR, one office that's responsible for mm -hmm. keeping the public interest um, uh, alive in what government does with data. Uh, what do you think of how the Canadian privacy SAR has been able to do and what the, the UK privacy SAR has been able to do? Well, obviously all this stuff has to be reassessed in light of Snowden mm -hmm. uh, because there is what they managed to affect in policy as written and then what they managed to affect in policy as enacted. Mm -hmm. uh, and the policy as written, there have, been, there have been good moments and bad moments, but surely all of it is swamped mm -hmm. by policy as it is enacted. Uh, we've had... Um, we suffer in our politics in all three of those territories from a, uh, an extremely high level of industrial influence on mm -hmm. policy at the expense of evidence. And this is not just in privacy domains. This is in every domain. There's been academic work on this in the U.S. where they found something like 90% of policy outcomes in the U.S. Were, could be predicted by effectively campaign right, contributions, right, right. you know, uh, and that's um, that seems a widespread thing. So where we've had policy uh, in privacy domains made, where there was no enormous industrial impact on in one way or another, where no one's ox was getting gored, they've been pretty good. Mm. Uh, and even in Ontario, at the, at the at a more regional level, you have people like Ann Kavukian, who was the privacy commissioner for many years, who made some really good policies. Where those policies came into conflict, conflict with things like lawful interception, or with um, even with things like uh, uh, DNA retention of people who are arrested but not charged with a crime, or, or ultimately not convicted of a crime in the UK, the, that either the policy wasn't made, the policy commissioners didn't make the right policy, or having made it, they were unable to make it stick. Stick. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is the, the basis on which this all has to be judged. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have I increasingly become convinced that we should think of the time that we live in now as a kind of interregnum during which our policy is so dominated by industrial self-interest that the only evidence-based policy that we can reliably enact as evidence-based policy that produces surplus capital for an industrial interest that will lobby its for continuation, and that our only strategy for salvation is to enact as many of those as possible in the hopes that a, a generally more evidence-led uh, political establishment can be can be moved away, can be weaned off of capital. I mean, I'm all for what Lessig has been doing with his with his um, uh, anti-super PAC PAC, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. he's he's raising money. Mm -hmm. Uh, through super PACs to elect candidates who will abolish super PACs right. that raise it's money for candidates. Right. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and I'm all for that, yeah. but I, I, it so far has been a very limited impact. And mm -hmm. and I think that it, there's nothing about that strategy that precludes also looking for evidence-based policies that also have a business model that produce people who lobby strongly for them. And I think why, it's why if the U.S. gets network neutrality, mm -hmm. it's going to get network neutrality because 
companies like Google make a lot of money from a neutral network mm -hmm. and would make less from a non-neutral network. And so Google will use some of the surplus capital from existing policies mm -hmm. to lobby for this. So I think one of the challenges is of, of trying to get better policy, especially for things like privacy over the Internet of Things, is that even in the parliamentary democracies like Canada and the UK, where the lobbying money is less, it's there, but mm -hmm. it's less, you get occasional politicians like Cameron saying, things like uh, perhaps we should ban social media applications that don't give us encryption keys, mm -hmm. right? So you actually have um, high profile political leaders um, speaking on behalf of the security establishment and advocating for things that most businesses wouldn't actually advocate for. It's true, although you could imagine easily that that would, that just like lawful interception has produced an extremely lucrative line of trade mm -hmm. for a lot of firms, mm -hmm. that a kind of what Cameron would no doubt call the next stage in lawful interception capability. Mm -hmm. You know, they keep calling it a data retention mm -hmm. directive or data retention initiative, not uh, let's ban all crypto initiative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, the, the same thing, same thing. Di different ways of saying it. Uh, you know, it could produce a lot of money. But this is actually an area where I think the US may have a slight advantage uh, because of the independences of its judiciary and because of the um, uh, strong constitutional uh, tradition. Uh, I, when I became a British citizen, I had to study and answer test questions on what an unwritten constitution is. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion was, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that conclusion has been well borne out. That's mm -hmm. not how I answered it on my citizenship quiz, but that's, there I think that's a right a, answer. There was a right answer for that. The right question. answer is it's <coughs> like, it's the Magna Carta and jurisprudence right. and norms and, and whatever jurisprudence the prime minister right. says it is, right? <laughs> right. And, and which appears to be right. nothing, right? right. right? Um, and in the US, I think it's instructive to look back to the legalization of crypto, because that was the last, mm -hmm. that, was, that was the last time this fight got fought. Got and, and during the crypto fight, uh, there were a bunch of things that happened. So people made a lot of arguments for strong crypto, the same arguments mm -hmm. they're making now. They said, first of all, the finance industry needs it. In yeah. fact, just, just for, for any kind of real security, you have to have real Banking crypto. Will fail. Yeah. Uh, and the NSA said, no, 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 no. We've mm -hmm. got a middle ground. What we're going to do is we're going to let you use crypto to key lengths of 50 bits, but not beyond 50 bits. Mm -hmm. And that will be enough that criminals can't get through it, mm -hmm. but not so much that we can't get through it. And um, that turned out just to be like wrong on its face, demonstrably wrong. Uh, EFF uh, co-founder John Gilmore designed a computer called the Des Cracker. Mm -hmm. It cracked Des in a couple of weeks for uh, a quarter million dollars mm -hmm. and, and showed that basically if you were the mafia and if this were the strongest code cipher that you could use in the banks, you could own all the banks in America for a quarter million dollars, right. right? Or if you were the Chinese government or whomever, right? right? Nobody cared, yeah. right? Like that's evidence, nobody mm -hmm. cared. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, made other arguments. Uh, they talked about um, the legitimacy of computer science, about the difficulty of, of demonstrating whether or not crypto works unless you can show the ways in which it's breakable, all these other things. Nobody cared about any of those. Mm -hmm. Then a programmer named Daniel Bernstein, who was a mathematician at UC Berkeley, published on Usenet, so not even in print, uh, source code for strong ciphers mm -hmm. that were stronger mm -hmm. than the NSA would allow, mm -hmm. and argued successfully through Electronic Frontier Foundation in the Ninth Circuit and at the appeals level that publishing code was a form of expressive speech and protected by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And the NSA lost, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is where an independent judiciary can do things mm -hmm. that uh, lawmakers can't. This is where you can mm -hmm. break their deadlock. Mm -hmm. um, and. Congress kind of, you know, one of, the, one of the few things that we can comfort ourselves with about American politics right now is that Congress can't make any law, mm -hmm. right? Effectively, they make no substantial law at mm -hmm. all. It's all done in state houses. Mm -hmm. State houses will almost certainly not be able to create Tackle this, this kind of law. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's likely that we'll have a legal void for mm -hmm. some time mm -hmm. in any event, maybe not in the UK and so on. But one of the huge differences between Bernstein, 1992, and uh, David Cameron saying that he wants backdoors on all crypto in 2015, mm -hmm. is there is now a widespread deployed base of strong crypto in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, practically speaking, although Parliament does make law, mm -hmm. if they were to make that law, the fact that the US would not follow suit would make it extremely hard for them to make that law stick. Okay, but then take me from, um, the fact of lots of crypto options to actually public knowledge of what crypto is and active use. So yeah. just in the last um, 
two or three months, I've noticed, this is a little inside baseball, but a lot of my academic colleagues in the UK, they're all sending um, GPG signed messages. Mm -hmm. It's become the default way of communicating. Mm -hmm. So clearly this stuff is in the news within the UK enough to scare some people into uh, digitally signing even the most banal messages. But does that mean that the public is actually doing living their political lives in an, encrypt, in an encrypted way? I haven't seen any good data on UK public mm -hmm. uh, opinion on this. In the US, there is some good data on this. Mm -hmm. The Pew survey, mm -hmm. which su studies Americans' attitudes towards the internet and mm -hmm. is considered to be extremely rigorous, mm -hmm. did a good study three months after Snowden that found that 87% of Americans had taken an affirmative step to protect their privacy in 90 days, mm -hmm. um, almost all of which had been useless mm -hmm. because there are really, like, the fact that you changed your Facebook privacy settings doesn't make you any more private. The, the, the existence of all those tick boxes in your Facebook privacy dash mm -hmm. is like all the lines on the craps table. They're there to make sure that you don't actually know what you're Understand betting on. What you're yeah. right. uh, and can't calculate your odds. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, um, the fact remains, right, that there is this like enormous appetite. And they did a follow-up survey a year later, and they found that Americans had taken more steps mm -hmm. and had become more anxious, and that they had recognized that there was a, um, that state surveillance and private surveillance were not separable. Mm -hmm. There's an unfortunate tendency, especially in European policy uh, circles, to try and divide state and private surveillance mm -hmm. uh, and to say that Americans are worried about state surveillance but they don't care about Google. Mm -hmm. And actually, the, they, they're inseparable. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. uh, if only because a state that relies on Google and Facebook to affect its surveillance will never effectively regulate Google's surveillance appetite, right? right? Because they just they, 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 their security services will confound their mm -hmm. legislative mm -hmm. initiatives. So mm -hmm. that's you know we you can't divide those two. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S., the attitude the, the attitudes have become the appetite has become even greater. Greater. And certainly, like Silicon Valley doesn't have a, a commercial commitment to surveillance. Mm -hmm. They surveil not because of ideology, they surveil because there was a market, that, you know, there was a surveillance business model. And there's a revenue stream for right. the data, right? That's and, the and the 87% of Americans who want a product that nobody's selling to them, mm -hmm. they're a market opportunity too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, Silicon Valley's venture capital community will back both sides of that horse race mm -hmm. cheerfully, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I am, I am buoyed up, I am cheered by the uh, belief that the reason, one of the reasons that crypto is so hard to get right, is so mm -hmm. hard to do as an individual, is not because of any intrinsic difficulty to crypto, there's undoubtedly mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. but because until Snowden, the only people who really recognized the need to encrypt their data mm -hmm. was uh, people who were already technologically very clued in. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, I make a comparison to uh, desktop publishing. Right, prior to desktop publishing, the only people who needed to lay out a magazine mm -hmm. or a page were people who were already typographers. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the tools that, that date from that era, they all assume that you have a lot of technical knowledge about typesetting. Mm -hmm. And what desktop publishing showed was that what we thought of as the irreducible core of expertise that you needed to lay out a page was a lot smaller mm -hmm. than, than it is now. Now it's still the case that there's a 5% kind of subtle art that a typographer latex, has that right. you will not get yeah, and yeah. I will not get That's even using latex yeah, right. yeah but but even but but using any tool using mm -hmm. page maker or latex mm -hmm. not we will never get there because mm -hmm. we lack that that nous yeah. but there is between mimeographs mm -hmm. And that ninety f and that five percent remaining there is a lot of territory that had yeah. never been covered. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you were Ed Snowden mm -hmm. and you had the full force of the surveillance searchlight mm -hmm. beaming on you from all of the world's surveillance agencies, you would probably need a lot of technical expertise mm -hmm. to stay safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if what we want to do is change the way surveillance works now, so mm -hmm. that there is an incremental cost to surveillance, mm -hmm. because right now in sort of a prism world. The, um, the 10 million in first Gmail user mm -hmm. adds no incremental cost to surveillance over the 10 millionth over Gmail 10 user. Right. Um, if what we want is for every person whom you surveil to cost between one and $10,000, mm -hmm. then um, we can probably attain that mm -hmm. just by rethinking how crypto should work 
in light of a wider appetite for crypto. Mm -hmm. I'm actually on the board of a 501c3 that works on this. Uh, um, I'm on the advisory board of, of Simply Secure, mm -hmm. um, which is just doing usability research mm -hmm. Uh, on putting front ends on existing best of breed free and open source software crypto tools like OTR mm -hmm. uh, and then documenting the process so that it turns into a toolkit for allowing other projects mm -hmm. to replicate the work and produce highly usable uh, lay usable crypto tools. So let me tie, let me tie those that data about the usability data mm -hmm. with what you were talking about with the Pew data. My understanding from some of that Pew data is that the um, there's a really interesting generation gap where our generation thinks of privacy as something, um, our generation of technology users thinks of, of privacy as something fairly specific that we would want to control that's worth a little time to learn and that perhaps the under 13 crowd doesn't think of privacy in the same way, isn't that worried, uh, is more concerned about figuring out which members of their family can see which content but actually doesn't want to spend time. Well, I think that's right, but I would I would put a different gloss on it. So Dana Boyd's written very well about this mm -hmm. in her book, um, uh, uh, It's Complicated. It's complicated yeah. she's, she's got a wonderful chapter on this and has done sub substantial work since. She's mm -hmm. just had a, an, a, an old fogey's view of social media mm -hmm. that she just put mm -hmm. up on, mm -hmm. on Medium. Uh, and um, what she says is that the narrative of the digital native has, is what confounds us here. Because mm -hmm. what we say is, oh, if you grew up with computers, then you know what they're for mm -hmm. in a way that you don't know what they're for if you, if you had them introduced to you later in life. Mm -hmm. Therefore, everything that young people do with computers reflects kind of some like underlying nature. It's like the experiment mm -hmm. where they, they raise children in the woods without language to see if they would speak the true language before the, mm -hmm. they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, the Babel of Evil, right, right. the Tower of Babel or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's, we, we, there's like, there's some pure, like kind of uh, platonic truth. In and, and what Boyd finds is that young people are tremendously worried about their privacy. Mm -hmm. They just don't know who they need to be private from, mm -hmm. right? They think that they need Which to be part private from up. their peers and their yeah. parents and their teachers, mm -hmm. and they, they don't have the forward-looking perspective to be able to put themselves in their shoes as young adults, look back and imagine what it will mean if police forces, governments, and employers, as well as prospective partners and so on, can look back on this material. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, tells you that um, it's not that young people don't care about privacy, it's that young people make dumb mistakes while that from which they learn mm -hmm. the hard way, mm -hmm. right? And, right. and uh, you know. And fundamentally, the technology changes. So you and I encountered computers, they're experiencing the internet over mobile phones, and within a few years, it will be some other wider I don't range know that of that's the. I don't know that that's why. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, obviously that's true. I just don't know that that's the important factor here. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, mobile changes a lot of how their usage patterns and may change their usage patterns still, although, you know, like, um, we know what it looks like if you were raised with a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet what it looks like if you were raised with a mobile phone and then have a 40 hour a week job and a kid, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, like those, that cohort is Different just dynamic, coming yeah. into existence. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we, it, we can't say prospectively which factor will be, will have a greater impact on the lives of those people having mobile access or, you know, like, will, will they find themselves tethered to home mm -hmm. the way that people are tethered to their homes when they have kids and jobs? Regardless of their mobile technology, we mm -hmm. don't know that because they yet. haven't gotten to that point in their life, and it may and it could go either way. Who right. knows, right? I I just think that um, they haven't yet gotten to the point where someone where they have suffered some terrible consequence because they put data where it would be retained and viewed by people who they haven't yet thought of as threats. That's right. Mm -hmm. But I, I also don't think that there's any reason to believe that given that they, when they appreciate that someone is a threat, they go to enormous lengths to keep mm -hmm. their data private from mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. that once they appreciate that the state or future employers or so on present and have a potentially adversarial relationship with their personal information, mm -hmm. that they wouldn't deploy all the same tactics same they deploy tactics now to, to make themselves safe right. from their parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, on that somewhat upbeat note, let's uh, conclude. My guest okay. today has been Corey Doctorow. Thank you. All Very right. Good conversation. Nice to, nice to talk to you, Phil. Yeah, thanks. thanks. See ya.